Okay, if you would, please take your Bibles and start in Revelation 20. Okay, and when I say start, that's intentional because we're going to be jumping around to a lot of scriptures today. All righty. So, I'm sure several of you have seen this bumper sticker. It says, come the rapture, this car will have no driver. You've seen that one before? Oh, how about this one? Come the rapture, can I have your car? <laughs> and then lastly, come the rapture, you can have my car. <laughs> there you go. So you see those things around, but, but, but I wonder as people see those things, even believers, do they really have an understanding of the why and the when of the rapture. I mean, I think it, it is fairly, fairly a, a common um, understanding in our, in our churches today that this thing is going to happen. Um, but I don't know that we, many Christians, and I'm very confident, very, very, very few unbelievers have a context, have a background in which to understand uh, this most significant event uh, that we're looking at. Of course, we uh, got into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and talked about that here it is, um, the dead in Christ will rise first. Those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we will always be with the Lord. So my title was accurate, up, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Up, those who are alive and shall remain will be away with the Lord. So up, up, and away. Here, there, in the air. I guess we could have said it that way too. But what I want to do today, I want to do something a little different. It's not a typical sermon. Okay, I, I want to set the rapture in the context of the biblical timeline as a whole so that you, when someone asks you about this or whatever, or just even for your own edification and for the glory of the Lord, we're, we're, what are we to do? We're to increase in the knowledge of God. We're to increase in the grace and knowledge. And uh, Christianity, your relationship with Christ is built on knowledge. Now, that's not the ultimate foundation. The ultimate foundation is the love of Christ manifested in the gospel. Uh, but the gospel itself is a, is, a, is a truth that we grab a hold of and that we live in light of. And the the following of Jesus to be a Christian means that you're using your head to think through what life and meaning and God is all about and that you're living in light of that. And so it's right and good for us to take some time here today and really open up um, what it means to really understand the context of the rapture and, and why it's coming, what's going on. But I want to, as I said, I, I kind of warned you during the, during the fellowship time that this is going to be a tremendous amount of information. I, I looked at my notes. I, I taught a lesson on eschatology. Uh, if you're not familiar, the word eschatos is Greek for the end. And so when we refer to eschatology, we're referring to the study of the end times. All right. So I, I taught a series of lessons a few years ago on eschatology, and there were 12 lessons in total. All right, so I'm taking about two-thirds of those. I'm going to put it into hopefully 45 minutes. I'm watching the clock. So if some of you get tired, and just go like this, and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. But, but just know you're going to get a fire hose of information today, a lot of information. Uh, the way that I'm thinking about this is just like we're walking, through the, we're walking through the town of theology, systematic theology, and here's the house of eschatology, okay? We're not going in. Okay, we're going to start, we're just going to walk around it and look in the windows, okay? Um, in order to go into it, you need to do the 12-week, you know, in-depth uh, study. So we're just going to look in the windows today, and, and you're going to come out of this, hopefully with some clarity, but you'll also come out probably with a lot of questions, and you're free to come and ask me anything for clarification, uh, but also I encourage you to, to study this on your own. It is a fascinating topic. So what we want to look at today is this, based on the biblical teaching on this topic, we must be ready for the rapture, which again, I think that's a fairly clear directive from Scripture, and we'll develop that now. So what we want to look at today are three concepts to grasp in reckoning with the rapture. Three concepts to grasp, grasp in reckoning with the rapture. Okay, first of all, the millennium. So what are we? 
we are pre-tribulational, premillennial dispensationalists. Amen? Good to go? Ready to wrap it up? That, that, that's the position of our church. Pre-tribulational, premillennial dispensationalists. So the key issue that develops that or, or kind of centers around that is the win, the, the main issue in the win of the rapture is how a serious-minded Christian understands the nature of the millennium. All right? So you've heard these various terms before. You've heard amillennial, right? You've heard postmillennial. You've heard premillennial. All right. These words, write them down or at least keep them in your mind because we're going to be coming back to these words several times throughout this message. All right. These are based, these positions, an amillennial position, an amillennial belief, a postmillennial belief, or a premillennial belief, are based on how we understand one main passage of Scripture. And it's Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6. So I asked you to turn there. And so let's read that together. <clears throat> Again, John's writing. Uh, he's under, under the, the inspiration of the Lord here. He writes this. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended, that he might be released. After that, he must be released for a little while. Verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom, the authority, to whom authority to judge was committed. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. All right. Now, when we come to this passage, and we look at these three positions, amillennialism, postmillennialism, and premillennialism, um, you can probably gather just by the, the word itself what the view of the millennium is. And all of these involve the second coming of Christ. When is he coming? Our amillennialist brothers and sisters, and that's what they are, they're our brothers and sisters, people who hold to differently, they believe that the millennium is not real. Ah, millennium. Now, they don't deny the scriptures at all. They just say that Revelation 20, 1 through 6 is completely symbolic. We'll get into that a little bit more. It's completely symbolic. <clears throat> There's no actual time that is a distinct millennium. Actually, it's what we're in right now. Essentially, from the resurrection of Christ all the way through to when the Lord returns in the second coming, that's the millennium, if it exists at all. And so it's all millennial. There's no millennium. Secondly, we have this view post-millennial. Now, a lot of our Brothers and sisters, we'll talk about this more. A lot of our brothers and sisters that are holding to this tend to be a little more politically active, and we'll talk about why. That Christ returns at the end of the millennium, post-millennium. All right, and then we have premillennial. Christ returns before the millennium. In both the amillennial position and the post-millennial position, the timing on it is indefinite. It's indefinite. The millennium lasts for however long. Premillennialism. There is an actual millennium that lasts a thousand years, as the text states. That's what we hold to. The main factor in how one reaches these various millennial positions is how one views the nation, people, group of Israel. That's one main factor. There's several of them. Okay. Amillennialism and postmillennialism believe in what we call replacement theology. All right. So what that means is that God was working through the Jews, that in order to understand God's ways and plans, you had to be familiar with the nation of Israel and in some ways even physically come to the nation of Israel and become a Jew. Now, again, we'll talk about this more later. It wasn't that you 
you were saved by doing all the rituals of the Jews, but you believed that the Messiah was coming through there. So when Christ came, what happened? Christ ends all the sacrifices. He ends all the rituals. And then in Acts 2, after the, after the ascension in Acts 1 and Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes, and now the church is the means by which God is reaching the world. Now, an amillennialist and a postmillennialist says that the church simply replaces Israel, that Israel does not exist in the biblical sense of that way anymore. It has no future for Israel, none, okay? That everything that's going on is just the church, and the church is all that exists until the second coming of Christ. Now, can Jews become part of the church? 100%. They can come on in and be a part of it. We, premillennialists, say that there is a clear future for Israel as a people and the church is distinct from Israel. It's different. We call this a discontinuity. You know, amillennialism, postmillennialism, continuity, Israel, church. Premillennialism, Israel, discontinuity, church, back to Israel. That's where we're holding, okay? Now, another major factor is how one interprets the prophecies of the book of Revelation, Amillennialism, it's completely symbolic. Everything that you read about in Revelation is just descriptive of something else. We really can't pin it down. Uh, so we can't look at various events that are going on in the world and say this is Revelation 13.2. We can't do that. Now, <clears throat> what scholars of amillennialism hold to is what we call a recapitulation theory of Revelation. You have your trumpet judgments, your bold judgments, and then what's the other one? Trumpets, bowls, seals. Okay, you have your three seal judgments. And they recapitulate every, throughout history, they're just going over and over and over again. And so what's happening in Revelation is just we're seeing all these difficulties and these hardships. But th this is just how history goes. And some of them may be worse than others. But this is just how history goes. And that's what will happen until Christ returns. Our Postmillennial brothers and sisters believe that everything in Revelation was all fulfilled in 70 AD. Now, you'll know what happened in 70 AD. That's when the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem. And that was the clear and total final end of Israel as God's means of working through that nation. It's utterly destroyed. Now, this means that everything in Matthew 23 and 24 that Jesus predicts about the future, all of that was fulfilled in 70 AD. What happens here now, um, and again, the technical term for this is called preterism, uh, that everything happens pre, pre. And if you talk to my brother James White and some of his friends, he will say that Revelation itself was written before 70 AD. It had to be written before 70 AD because it's talking about things that are going to happen in 70 AD. Well, the vast majority of evangelical scholars for decades have held that John is writing on the Isle of Patmos at the end of his life in the 90s, post-70 AD. So whatever else um, we know about Revelation, it couldn't have occurred in 70 AD because the book was written after the fact, after the fact. All right, we, premillennialists, hold that Revelation is all future. We're futurists. That everything in there from chapters 4 through 22 is future, and that it has a literal manifestation of some type or another. Now, do we agree that Revelation is filled with symbolism? Absolutely. But those symbols are pointing to a reality of some type. How will it work itself out in time and space? That's up for, you know, all kinds of fun debate. And I encourage you to sit around with friends and say, okay, what's going to happen in the tribulation, you know, with these two witnesses here? What, what are they going to look like? Well, again, there's speculation and fun and all that type of stuff. But the point is, is that we, as, under, as we understand it from our position, we understand Revelation 4 through 20 to be completely future, specifically attached to the tribulation. All right, another factor. So here we got, how do people view the nation of Israel? How do we understand the book of Revelation? How do we understand just how history will work itself out? Now here, here we have... Jesus speaking in Matthew 24, 4 through 8, he says this, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. 
For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. But all of these things are the beginning of the birth pains. So from a post-millennial point of view, you're saying all of that occurred before 70 AD. We're saying no. It's happening in greater, in greater prevalence now. And we'll keep on. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, and he says, difficult times will come. Things will go from bad to worse. Our all-millennial and premillennial brothers agree, this is our all-millennial brothers and us, we agree that the trend of history is from bad to worse. Until Christ returns, we're going to continue to see a degradation of humans and offloading the dignity of God, offloading the image of God, suppressing God's truth, and that's going to be something that we see throughout history. Postmillennialists, in light of 70 AD, that all of this occurred in 70 AD, things are going to get better and better, and then Christ will return to a Christianized world. I won't say anything. Um, because of this, you might notice some of our post-millennial brothers and sisters tend to be a little more politically active. They tend to be saying, look, Christ is coming back to a Christianized world. Therefore, it is our responsibility to Christianize that world, and it's our responsibility to change government in that regard. Now, this is not to deny the reality that it's good and right for Christians to get involved in government. But to be, this is where I struggle with it, because we have, we have a responsibility to speak truth to power, for lack of a better term. It's right and good that we as Christians should be calling out abortion as wicked sin. It's right and good that we should be calling out uh, injustice where we see it as sin. But I struggle with the idea that we're going to be able to do away with that stuff. Jesus said it this way, you will always have the poor with you. There will always be injustice in this world. He, he said, look, there's going to be reasons for sin. There will always be stumbling blocks in this world. But woe to the one who brings the stumbling block. And then again, Paul writes to Timothy, things are going to go from bad to worse. And you look at the passage where he says that people are going to be lovers of self, lovers of money, haters of parents, haters of God. And so we've been seeing more or less of that throughout history. And so we, we, we look at our current day and we say, okay, is this it? And we'll talk about at the end of the message, is this now the final, final apostasy before the coming of Christ for the rapture? And we say, amen, yes, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But we also know that Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour. Um, I've had friends of mine say, we could be in the early church. Okay meaning Jesus might not come for several thousand more years, and that's his prerogative. But if we look, and we'll talk about this at the end, if we look at what's going on in the world, this stuff seems to be lining up in a premillennial position. Okay, so we have how one views the nation of Israel, how one interprets the book of Revelation, how history will work itself out, and then another factor is what is the nature of the tribulation and the day of the Lord? Matthew 24, 21 says this, for there will be, this is Jesus speaking, he says, there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. So, is that 70 AD? Other places it says the tribulation is coming over the whole world. That tribulation was in Israel. And there's been great, great tribulations of a similar nature to that throughout history. I think during the, the Roman invasion and destruction of Jerusalem, over 250,000 people were crucified. 250,000 Jews crucified. Well, last century, how many millions of Jews, how many millions of others died in extremely tragic, vicious, wicked ways. A millennial position, all of history until the second coming of Christ is great tribulation. <clears throat> Postmillennial, the great tribulation took place in 70 AD. Premillennial, it is the distinct seven-year period that is in the future. Distinct seven-year period that is in the future. So, those are your millennial positions.
Secondly, this morning, another key factor in understanding the rapture is to embrace dispensation or to understand dispensationalism. Not embrace it, but I think you should. But anyway. Um, so, <clears throat> first year Paige and I were married. We attended an evangelical free church in Greeley, Mountain View E Free. And our pastor resigned, and he took a church in Iowa. And so we were without a pastor. Um, Paige and I actually left before they, they got a new pastor. We moved to Texas. But, um, and so they were in a time of where having people come and fill the pulpit. And there was a student from Denver Seminary, right here, down in Littleton, who came and preached. And I had been accepted to Dallas Seminary. And so after the sermon, I went up and I said, hey, I'm going to seminary, you know, stuff. He goes, oh, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Dallas. And his countenance dropped. He goes, why are you going there? I mean, literally, that's how he sounded. Why are you going there? I said, why not? He said, they're dispensational. I said, what does that mean? Literally, that was the first time I had heard that term. Okay, here I am going to a dispensational school. I don't even know what it means. I soon found out. Um, but, but here's the thing, is that it's vital that we, if we are embracing or even understanding pre-tribulational, premillennial dispensationalism, we, we best know what dispensationalism is, right? Helpful there. All right, so let's take some time. Let's take some time to see if we can get a basic grasp of what it means or what is meant by dispensationalism. The main issue of the Bible is this. The overall theme of the Bible from cover to cover, is this. How does man live in such a way to bring glory to God by being intimately known and knowing him? That's it. It's basically Genesis 1 through Revelation 22. How does man bring glory to God and be rightly related to him? That's the main thing from cover to cover. And of course, the gospel is the answer to that question. Now, in biblical history, there are two eras of how this occurred. Two, only two. How, did God, how does God relate to man in such a way that it brings glory to him and we're known by him and knowing him? First one, Adam and Eve. Okay, there's your first one. No sin, no struggles, no wickedness, no nothing. They're with God in the state of perfection. No need for salvation, nothing like that. They're walking with him in the cool of the garden. They know him, all this type of stuff. That's Genesis 1 and 2. Then the fall, Genesis 3. From Genesis 3 to Revelation 22, or we can say 20 because 21 and 22 are the new heavens and new earth. Revelation 3, I'm sorry, Genesis 3 to Revelation 20. It's grace. That's it. The only way that a man or a woman or a person can be right with God is through God's grace his willingness to deal with our sins, not punish us for them, be merciful to us, give us his righteousness, and then we come to know him. The earliest, clearest declaration of this is found in Genesis 15, 6, where God says to Abraham, or Abraham hears God, believes his promise, and we know this, and he believed God and God credited it to him as righteousness. So God takes his righteousness and puts it on Abraham. That's what he does with us. He takes Christ's righteousness and puts it on us. And that is how we can be made right with God. Now, you go back to Genesis 3, it's even there where God makes a promise. I will send, I will send someone to defeat Satan. Satan will bite his heel, but he will crush his head. Very first prophecy about Jesus right there. And throughout the Old Testament, we have what we call progressive revelation about the nature of who this person would be. Okay, we learn in Isaiah 53 that what? He's going to bear our sins in his body. We learn in Isaiah 9 that a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will be on his shoulders. Okay, we, we learn in Micah 5 too that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. We learn in, I think, Isaiah 14, behold, a virgin shall be with child, and he shall be called... Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. You, you, you get it. There's different passages throughout the Old Testament that reveal to us more about this Savior. But what happens is that the Savior is completely manifested and given to us in the person of Christ. Now, <clears throat> that's how we understand 
the main overall theme of the Bible. What is God doing? He's determining and putting before us how man is made right with God. Genesis 1 and 2, no need for a Savior. Genesis 3 through Revelation 20, grace, period, a Savior. That's what we need. Now, there's another way and another helpful way of understanding history. Not salvation history, but how God's plan is being manifested in time and space. How are we doing? Not yet? Okay. Yeah, Josh is, Josh is out. Okay. There's another helpful way of understanding history. Not salvation history, but how God's plan is being manifested in time and space. And these are called dispensations. A basic definition of a dispensation is how something is given out or distributed. How something is done. Biblically, Ephesians 3, 8, and 9 specifically talk about dispensations. Paul writes this, To me, though I am the very least of the saints, was this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for all ages in God who created all things. That word plan is oikonomios in the Greek. It's the word we get, our economy. Now, economy, you think money right away, but it's not just that. It's how things are done in a given place and time. You know, we have an economy of, you know, whatever. I don't know. But dispensation, if you, if you use Look at other Bibles. They, this word is translated as dispensation. Everyone, what is the dispensation of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? Now, we are premillennial dispensationalists. Most dispensationalists hold to what we call seven eras or times that the Bible indicates God is working differently. He's not saving differently, but he's working differently. The economy is different in these seven dispensations. Now, again, there's a lot, a lot of opinion and thought on this. So there's people that hold to 14 dispensations. Some hold to three, right? and anywhere in between. Traditionally, and I think most accurately and simply, I don't mean simply in the sense of not smart, but in the sense of this is how we hold it together, how we see things, that there's seven main dispensations, and here they are. There's the Adamic dispensation, the time of Adam, Genesis 1 and 2. Well, that ends in Genesis 3, and so then we have what we would call the Noahic dispensation from the fall in Genesis 3 to the flood, so Genesis 3 through Genesis 11. Then we have the Abrahamic dispensation, Abraham to the cross and resurrection of Christ. First two kind of short, this one big, long, okay? So God speaks to Abraham, begins to present himself and the means of salvation and worship through Abraham and his descendants. So that's Genesis 12 through Acts 1, the ascension of Christ. Now, you're right and good to say, wait a minute, is, is there not a, is there not a you know, sub-dispensation in here the Gospels, the life of Christ, yes. Okay, that is there. But until Christ dies and raises again, the Old Testament system of sacrifice and worship is ongoing. And Christ participates in that, is a part of it. It's only when Christ dies and is resurrected and ultimately when he's ascended that that dispensation, that means of engaging with man, ends. So now... We have the Abrahamic that ends with the ascension of Christ in Acts chapter 1. Now we have the church dispensation, or the dispensation of the church. Now, historically, a major confusing point here is that some dispensationalists refer to this as the age of grace. That is a bad thing to say because the age of grace starts in Genesis 3. It's in that, that's the salvation. The salvation means, what is it? Genesis 1 and 2, Perfection. Genesis 3 through Revelation 20, grace. So the age of grace is Genesis 3. So if someone says the church is the age of grace, make them clarify that. Make them clarify that because grace is all that's ever been since Genesis 3. So I think rightly we call this the age of the church. And this starts with the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 and it goes to the rapture. So Acts 2 through Revelation 3 to the end of the church age. 
And this is the message no longer, the message of salvation is no longer going through the nation of Israel. The message of salvation by grace is going through the church. After the rapture, we have the tribulation, a seven-year time of God's righteous wrath being poured out on mankind, ending at the second coming of Christ. This is Revelation 4 through 19. Revelation 4 through 19. All right. At that point, God removes the church through the rapture and begins the message of salvation by grace through the nation of Israel again. And if you read Revelation, you're going to find a couple of things. Chapters 1 through 3, church, 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 church. Chapters 4 through 19, church isn't mentioned. Israel, 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 Israel. And you'll see in there that God sets apart, well, just one example, he sets apart the 144,000 for the purpose of declaring the gospel. There's the two witnesses, Jews, declaring God's truth, speaking to the world, the gospel then. At the end of the seven-year tribulation, Christ returns, the second coming, and the millennium begins where Christ reigns on earth for a 1,000 years. And that's Revelation 20 that we read here earlier. And it ends in the eternal state, the new heavens and the new earth, which is Revelation 21 and 22. Seven dispensations, Adamic, Noahic, Abrahamic, church, tribulation, millennium, eternal state. That's how history, what we think history is going to work itself out that way. So that's dispensationalist. So if you believe this, which if you're part of this church, you're okay with it minimally. All right. If you believe this, you are pre-tribulational, pre-dispensation, pre-millennial dispensationalists. Now, let's put the rapture into all of this. Let's put the rapture into all of this so we understand it. So again, pre-tribulational refers to that the rapture is going to occur, the church will be removed before the tribulation. Now again, amillennialists, postmillennialists say that the rapture and the second coming of Christ are concurrent. That the dead in Christ rise up, those of us who are alive and remain go. Christ meets them in the air and then he comes down immediately. Comes down immediately and begins the millennium. So <clears throat> we hold, biblically, we feel that the most accurate, concise, coherent understanding of scripture indicates very clearly that the rapture occurs before and even might inaugurate the tribulation. Now that doesn't mean that you know, the day the rapture occurs, the Antichrist shows up and the seven years begin but it's awfully close. The rapture ends the era of the dispensation of the church, and then God begins working through the nation of Israel again to proclaim the gospel during the tribulation. Why do we particularly hold this position? Okay, number one, there's a clear distinction between Israel and the church, and God has a plan for Israel. That, that's huge, all right? That is huge. If that isn't clear in Scripture... If we, we hold to this replacement theology, if someone holds this replacement theology that Israel just goes into the church and there's no future for it, then dispensationalism, pre-tribulational, pre-relinial dispensationalism falls. It really does. So if there's no history or if there's no future for Israel, dispensationalism doesn't work. It just doesn't. However, we think there is, and the scriptures indicate this. See, again, this is where we're just looking in the window, okay? Because we could list off dozens of passages that deal with this. But we'll look at Romans 11, 25 through 27. Lest you be wise in your own sight, Paul is speaking to the Gentiles, and he's talking to them about what's going on with Israel. Why isn't Israel embracing the gospel? And what's going to happen to them? What's their future? He says this, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until, listen, the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Got it? That's the church. Now, do Israelites become part of the church? Absolutely. All the writers of the Bible except Luke, New Testament. Is there somebody else? Luke is a Gentile, okay? But, but all the rest are Jews. They're writing this stuff. Jesus was a Jew. So, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, and, verse 26, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. This, is my, this will be my covenant with them as I take away their sins. Clearly, Paul believes that there's a future for Israel. 
My brother James, I watched a debate um, with him, and he I don't remember the topic, but all I remember, okay, don't share this with him. All, all I remember, he'll probably, he's probably listening right now. James, are you listening? So, James got up and said, Paul was not a dispensationalist, neither am I. And I want to say, Paul was not a postmillennialist, neither am I. So there you go. I think Paul was a dispensationalist. I think he is a dispensationalist, still is, okay? And that's where it's at. So there is a future for Israel. That seems clear. And it seems clear from end to end of the Bible. It really does, okay? And we, again, we're looking in the window. The tribulation is a future distinct event marked by God's intense judgment on the unbelieving mankind in the world. Here's Matthew 24, 21 again. Jesus says, for then there will be great tribulation, such has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. Romans chapter two, verse five, Paul writes to the Romans, because of your hard heart, your hard and impenitent heart, and he's speaking to Jews and Gentiles here, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. God's word clearly states that the church will not be in the tribulation, but the people of Israel will be proclaiming the gospel during this time. One of the most encouraging texts that I look at understanding the times, and I can't remember the exact chapter, but it's in Ezekiel that talks about the Valley of Dry Bones. Is that 34? Okay, anyway, uh, there's a passage, where? 37. 37, thank you, Court. In Ezekiel 37, and there's this prophecy that talks about the land of Israel being covered with dry bones. And that's symbolic, right? What is he saying? He's saying the land is filled with dead people, filled with spiritually dead people. Does that not describe Israel today? Now, there's some very, very ultra-conservative Hasidic Jews there that are very religious, but don't believe the Messiah. I'm sure there's a small percentage of Messianic Jews there. But the very vast majority of Jews, even in our day, are secular or atheist. Or if they're believers at all, it's just simply tradition and ritual, and that's it. Spiritually dead. Other places in the Bible, God says he's going to bring all of his people back to the land. Okay, Before 1948, 6% of the world's Jews lived in Israel. Now it's 40%. And it's continuing to grow. Bringing the Jews back into the land. And so, what we understand based on these passages is that he's going to bring his people back and then according to the Ezekiel passage, Ezekiel 37 passage, he will put skin and flesh onto these people and breathe life into them, meaning he will make them spiritually alive. And as Zach, I think it's Zechariah says, they will look on the one whom they've pierced and they will cry. In other words, they will believe in Jesus. Those are our Jewish neighbors and friends. Now again, all millennialists, post millennialists say, nope, none of that. Whatever happened in Ezekiel 37, it's past. And I don't mean to be trite with that. That's where they're at. So, Revelation 4 through 19 describes this tribulation, and it does not mention the church one time while consistently referencing the people of Israel as his messengers during that time. Okay, God's word states that the church is not destined for wrath and will be removed from this world to go and be with the Lord Jesus. And that's what we looked at last week. The dead who are in Christ will rise first. We who are alive and remain will be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5.9, which we'll look at next week, God says this through Paul, for God has not destined us, who? The Thessalonians, believers, us. He has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's this time of wrath coming. There's this day of wrath. There's this great tribulation. Paul writes and says, God has not destined us for that, speaking to the church. Revelation 3.10, which we read in in the Bible reading this morning. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, 
I will keep you from, keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Keep you from, meaning remove you, take you away, get you out, not save you in, get you out. And then, of course, most comforting, John 14, 1 through 3, Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Well, people might say that's the second coming. Well, does Christ return to heaven at the second coming? No. He stays here. He reigns for a thousand years. But he does come on the clouds and calls his people to himself and takes us into his presence. All right. Friends, that's just a little spin around the room. Okay, I hope this was helpful. Some people are nodding. Some people are like, whoa, that was really tough and boring. Others, I hope it's helpful. Again, 12 messages on this that I did several years ago. And you got it all in about 40 minutes or at least two-thirds of it in about 30 minutes. Regardless, okay, I've referred to amillennialists and postmillennialists as our brothers and sisters. Anyone who's believing the gospel of Jesus Christ in a saving way and not adding heresy of some kind into it Those are our brothers and sisters. We would call this an area of separation. In other words, if there's three churches in the town and one's dispensational, one's all-mill, and one's post-mill, I'm going to the dispensational church. That's that's where I'm at. So it is an area of separation, but not disfellowship. These people are not unbelievers. There are three things that we all hold. There will be a rapture. That's clearly biblical. Amillennialists, Postmillennialists say it's concurrent with the second coming of Christ. We go up, meet Christ in the air, then we come down. All right? We say no. Rapture, be with Christ, out of the tribulation, come and reign with him in the, in the millennium. So those two things, there's a rapture and there's a second coming of Christ. Thirdly, there's a judgment. These are things that we all hold. R.C. Sproul, Kevin DeYoung, other people like this that we really hold in high esteem, Tim Challies. These are our brothers who don't believe in dispensational understanding of Scripture, but they do know there's a rapture. They do know there's a second coming, and there will be a judgment. The question is this. Are you ready? Are you ready? That's the application point. Are you ready? All this technical stuff I've just given you, one thing. Are you ready? Is there debate on how it's going to work itself out in time and space? Yep. Am I going to sit here and get up and say without, uh, you know, without doubt that I've nailed it? No. Okay. Not going to do that. It might be different. Rapture, second coming, judgment. Okay. Be ready. Be ready. Acts 1, 6 through 8 says this. So when they had come together, this is the apostles. Again, this is Christ right before he ascends to heaven. When they had come together, they asked him, Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? I look at that statement right there, and I say, how can you embrace uh, uh, a replacement theology? How can you do that? Jesus doesn't say, I'm not doing that. He says this, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And if we understand that as an answer to that question, he's saying there is a time when the kingdom will be restored. When? When? Jesus says, not for you to know. But here's what he says. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's where we're at right now. That's where we're living. Okay. Matthew 24, 36, Jesus says this. Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, the Father only. So what are we to do? Well, Jesus tells us in Luke 12. Stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. Be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Are you ready? Are you believing in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins and eternal life? Are you believing 
that he went to that cross, paid the penalty for you, died and rose again. Are you believing that? Are you trusting totally and completely in him? And if you're doing that, you're ready. Now, can we grow and mature and develop more? Absolutely. Can we gain a deeper understanding of some you know, significant areas of theology? Absolutely. Every single one of us are theologians. Every single one. Just are you thinking correctly? Are you thinking accurately? What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. It's A.W. Tozer. You're a theologian. The goal is to think accurately. At the beginning of the Thessalonians exposition, I quoted Philip de Corsi, and I want to end with him here. Uh, this was in Texas last year, and he was talking uh, a message out of 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, and you know that passage is about loving and serving the local church. Okay, that passage starts off with these words. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be sober-minded and self-controlled for the sake of your prayers. The end of all things is at hand. It's coming. Then he says this. Time is marching on and bringing us ever closer to that golden hour when the Lord Jesus will return for his church at the rapture, just as he promised in John 14 and Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. And I tell you this, one look at the contemporary moment that we are in, this present time within history, and I think you and I would conclude that the stage is being set for the soon return of Jesus for his church. Now, it is my conviction, and I know it is this church's conviction, that Jesus' return is imminent. It is at any moment, possibly, when Jesus will come and catch us up to heaven at the rapture. It is the next prophetic event, and it requires no fulfillment of signs to take place. Although, having said that, let me make a further qualification. It is fair to say, is it not, that the rapture won't take place in a vacuum. And the reason I say that is that the rapture is a trigger event. It will have a domino effect, setting in motion prophetic events that will happen in quick succession. The stage will need to be set globally for the events that follow the rapture. And we are witnessing that very thing, are we not? Israel reborn. When Israel came back into existence in 1948, only 6% of the world's Jews lived in Israel. Today, over 40% of the Jewish people are in their homeland. That is a super sign. Globalism, wars, catastrophes. We see technologies creeping past society. We see Russia rising. We see China in its power. We see the kings of the East rising. We see European convergence, which will be the home of the Antichrist's kingdom. We see apostasy in the church. A falling away. We see rebellion and lawlessness. The spirit of the Antichrist is among us. We see the days of Lot and Noah, morally speaking. We see people going about their business saying judgment is not coming, in marrying and being given in marriage. These global trends, these moral conditions, these economic realities, these political facts, these are all runway lights for the approaching return of the Lord Jesus Christ who is coming to deliver us from this wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 tells us. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 tells us that we have not been appointed for wrath of the tribulation of the day of the Lord. Jesus is coming to deliver us from that rapture. So given that reality, we need to be serious. Amen? Based on the biblical teaching on this topic, we must be ready for the rapture. I don't think anyone went to sleep. What? Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you so much. And... Thank you for uh, the word, Lord.